Shackick, Doc Weez, Onslaught, Supply, Jeremiah Black. Good morning. How are you guys doing? <clears throat> dun, 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 dun. We're going to get started in a minute. Or two or three. during class <laughs> I'm doing all right had a pretty good weekend I'm trying to remember what we did on Thursday I think we were working on a custom random battle random encounter system Oh yeah, I heard it, it got like awful reviews. Like even big places that normally give terrible games seven out of 10s, they were like five out of 10. It was like the biggest blunder the studio has made since their last game, A got them. What's up, Vapor? You're watching During Home. We did a lot on Thursday, like attempt to beta test a game multiple times to no avail. What do you mean to no avail? <clears throat> yeah, IGN gives everything a 7 out of 10. It's like, they could review it, this game is imbalanced, blah 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 blah, and this is not actually not that fun, blah blah blah. Well, there's probably bugs. The game may not run for you. Seven out of ten. Like, so when they give it a five, you know it's complete dog garbage. I'm not gonna get Fallout 76. As a fan of the original Fallout series, it's kind of not really upsetting because I kind of expected this garbage to be honest. The reason th the reason I expected that is there you can't have mod support with an MMO, right? And the mods are what make all of their other games work and ha and fun. So if you can't have mods and you have to rely on the studio to make the game balanced and fixed and fun, you know it's just not going to work. Morning, Whiteley. How are you doing? How was your weekend? Computer's muted. <laughs> Didn't it? How do you know what I'm saying? Do you have like speech to text turned on? Does that work on live? Sonic is the best, worst franchise. I agree. I mean, some of their games are basically unplayable. But like that one game where you can just keep jumping and pausing with, with Knuckles. You can basically fly around. It's so broken. So you can just get to like any area. Except for a few areas where there's blocked off at the top. Oh, you're doing the IGMC, Whiteley. That's cool. Anyway, we should probably get started. Let me uh, turn this off. 
Oh, I've watched a lot of Dan and Aaron play Sonic games. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shoot. i to take this off. How's it going, everybody? I'm Drifting from Driftwood Gaming. We're going to do a live stream on Natural Explorers. Thank you for joining me. Hope you had a good, fantastic weekend. I had a great one. Let's get started. Last Thursday, um, I stream Monday through Friday, but on Fridays I usually do different stuff. So we played Omori on Friday, which is a fantastic game. Do you guys know that they raised a lot of money on Kickstarter? Like, a lot of money. It was, it was for, for, a, for an RPG Maker project, it's a lot of money. The games raised $200,000. I just wanted to throw that number out there. They have like five or 6,000 backers. It's, it's pretty impressive. I didn't know that until after um, I was looking for the link for their Kickstarter. I was like, holy crap. They do not even need my advertisement at this point. But yeah. 5,000 backers, over $200,000 in an RPG Maker game. So here's our graveyard, and we're making it so that when the player walks on the purple region, there's a chance, uh, well, it's going to call a common event every time. And the common event Let's find it. I made a memo for myself. Add a warp item. Okay, I'll do that. I'm glad I did that because I have totally forgot about that. Adding comments and memos to your to your events is always a good idea. Wait, wait, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 76? What happened to 5 to 75? Yeah. Anyway, we're... We were making a pseudo-random uh, battle system that, uh... Random encounter battle system that gives us more control so that the player can't get bad RNG and get stuck with uh, a combat a few steps after another combat. We also give the player, based on your guys' suggestions, a little bit of a warning with a, a balloon, exclamation, a bubble pops up on the player's head when they're getting close to the time. Like within the next 12, 10 to 12 steps, there's going to be a battle. The player will have an, uh, an exclamation that'll give them the, the, um, the notification so that they can press escape and go to their menu and heal up for the next battle that's inevitably going to take place. And then whenever the player the timer reaches that many, 40 to 50 steps, which you can change arbitrarily. Easy to change this number or this number, these numbers. And once we do that, it'll change the number of steps the player has to have. So if I feel like it's too grindy, we can change that. And I could even make a random encounter difficulty setting and add a number based on the difficulty setting. But what I need to do is incorporate more things into Yenfly's help window because I really like the help window. Like I want it to I want to be able to toggle switches and variables from the help window. So I may look at a little bit of the help file today. It's not super exciting, I know, but it's a necessity. Just like beta testing, whoever was talking about um beta testing, vapor. Like if you don't you may seem boring because you're doing the same thing over. But if you don't do that, then you're going to have a problem with your own quality control in your game. Give them the Iverson crossovers to Karajakic. Let's take a look at our event. Control a variable, roll between four to five every time we step on a purple tile, which is every walkable tile in the graveyard. It's going to do this, so add to a variable if it's over 150. Um, 
and less than 200, then show an exclamation. If it gets over, equal or over to 200, control the variable and pick a random number between one and the number of battles, max enemies we have, and then do battle processing using that variable. So if, if we win, we're going to get a Necronite and do the gab text and gab sound uh, and clear the gab window, force it to play so that we get a Necronite and the player knows that. We reset the, the variable so that it starts the counter over. If we run away from the battle, it just doesn't give us any loot, but it also doesn't give us any um, problems. It just resets the counter. If we lose, we, it's not game over. We show an animation of falling in combat, fade out the screen, we wait 10 frames, we transfer the player to the house, player's house. We check the player's money, and we put a, the player's money into a variable, then we take that variable, set a variable to that variable. Maybe there's some redundancy here, but maybe we'll use this for something else. So I'm gonna leave it this way for now. Then we're going to divide the player's money by 10, which is the death penalty temporary variable. I'm using just for this specific thing. And then we're going to change the gold by the player's death penalty gold. So I didn't want this to read change gold minus player's money because I didn't want, I want to keep player's money equal to the value of gold they currently have. Just for some other reason that arbitrarily I want to keep it that way. So that I can see, we want to subtract the death penalty for gold, not the player's money from their gold. And then we're going to give the player some notification, you've been discovered by the wandering witch, and let the player know that they were robbed of 10% of their, their money for the recovery there's a, there's a little surcharge, 10% of their current gold uh, to, to not game over. I don't want the player to, to game over. Then we're gonna fade in the screen, show an animation that they've been rested, restore, restore the entire party, wait 10 frames, and um, then we reset the, the counter as well. So the player doesn't get into a battle the first step they take back into the graveyard. I don't think we did a lot of testing for um, the battle system. That's what Vapor was saying. But we did start testing it because we ran out of time. So I think everything should work, didn't we? Didn't we test dying in combat? Let's see if there's any bugs I should fix right at the beginning. Let's be a mechanized battle toaster. about this system over this week this weekend like when I was laying down trying to go to sleep I'm thinking about this enchanting system I made and to be honest I'm not super happy with it the reason why is it's very menu based it feels like not very modern of a like crafting system like it's annoying right you have to go to your players thing you have to take off your weapon and then you have to select your weapon, or you have to select what, an empowering gem, and then you have to select the weapon, and then, well, of course the player wants to enchant it, because why would they go through the process of, you know, it's just, like, that's nice, and all the enchanting, yeah, we've got it upgraded, but it felt very cl clumsy to me, like, I want to remake it. I'm not happy with it. I mean, it's a cool little side system, excuse me, for now, but I want to make it different. I want to make a better enchanting system, not just like level one, level two. I want to make like an item that the player can, like when you go to the screen, it pops up a picture instead of a show choice it, or select item. It pops up a menu, like a new scene, pushes a new scene, and then the player can use the mouse. I mean, I, I want to incorporate keyboard and game controller um, functionality but the only way I was thinking about making it work was with the mouse for now so I mean I'll do the way that I know it'll work and then try to make it work for other systems as well and, and I could always scrap it but anyway I'm thinking of a, a thing where we're showing pictures we're calling common events with the pictures we show and then the player can just select like a certain number 
like we'll have like show a, a picture for a, a new scene but it'll just lock the player right here and then show a picture the size of the screen and then on top of that draw a couple of pictures like one for weapons one for armors and the player clicks it boom weapons and then it can show it can show another is that the phone i'm not gonna go get it i have my cell phone if somebody really needs to get a hold of me <clears throat> Was I saying? Oh, like pictures on top of pictures. And we'll click on um, like weapons or armors. And then if it's a weapon, it'll it'll show the list of, of each of the, the main hero's weapons. So I'm gonna have one specific weapon that gets upgraded however the player wants it to be upgraded. And not just a bunch of uh, like a bunch of weapons, really. It's like the player's gonna craft their main weapon. So you would pick like the, the light blade, or you'd pick like the rod, or you'd pick whatever other party member weapons. And so you click on that and it would call another show picture. It would erase this picture and call another show picture. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then once you, so you're like in that menu, you can select what crafting item do you want to use on that weapon. You can find like a, say we find like a, I don't know, the Empowering Gym, say that for example. Uh, the Empowering Gym will raise its um, its level, and that can remove an item and add an item. Similar to the, the way this works, but instead of going through menu to menu to menu with text, the player can use icons and images instead of reading lines. I don't know if that would be... I don't know how uh, more interesting that would be I think about it I mean it's gonna it's going to look better and, and probably feel better and play better but it's it's still menus that you're clicking through but except you know except this time you're not you're not reading a line of text you're showing instead of telling so I'm thinking if we do it that way we'll show the enchanting system instead of instead of make the player read about the enchanting system I mean, similar to the way we did this, right? This is our world map, and the player presses escape to exit. <clears throat> I'm not ignoring you guys. Let's see. You guys talking a lot about Fallout still? Vapor says that. I can't really hate games unless they're really bad. The only time I can hate a game is if it like has a lot of microtransactions and like the game is fun and it would be more fun if it didn't have all the microtransactions. I can hate a game because of the microtransactions. Like this would be a good game and I freaking hate it because they made it this way. Like they instead of trying to make the game fun, they made the game they programmed the game to cost a lot of money. I like The Witcher. The Witcher's great. I bought The Witcher 2 for like $2, and then I was like, okay. I didn't beat it. I was like, I want to play the newer one. And this was years ago, a couple years ago. And what was it? It was it was the Witcher the Witcher three right before the, the the Great Winter or something like that expansion DLC. I didn't get the the DLC, but I bought it because it was like on fifty percent off sale. Played it quite a bit. Have I played Red Dead Redemption two? No, I haven't. It's so awesome that we actually have 
the mecha mechanized battle tester. Okay, let's see the battle system here. We get the icon, and then we get into a battle. We need to make a battle background. That's the thing we were doing at the end. I remember now. And this is a level eight creature, we're level one. So we're going to die. Why is he dealing zero damage though? Even at level one, well, that's why. Because he's level one. You just can't hurt it at level one. Oh, we had another problem too, <clears throat> with this not working. <coughs> the Red Phoenix not bringing it back to, to life, but now it did. We just need to make sure that it targets a dead ally. Toaster Beam! Zero! Our stats are that low? At level one. That's kind of frustrating. I mean, Jinx is level eight, so it makes sense that she's surviving. Obviously the player is not supposed to be here at level one, but they could potentially go here and fight this highest level creature and even harder creatures, right? Weapon Unleashed, please do damage. Okay, so the Weapon Unleashed actually does damage. But not a lot. Not a lot. I need to rename this tonic to just call purple. Because that's what T wanted it to be called. I made it as to, to be like the, the Mega Elixir. But she said, you should just call it purple instead of... I was like, you mean purple tonic? No, just purple. Okay, we'll name it purple then. Is that supposed to be a baby chimera? Kind of. Jinx can uh, weapon unleash too. battle background. I should just start um, the battle toaster. I should start both of them at level 5 to put them in the center instead of max level right now. I mean, not ne necessarily max level, they can go up farther, but the highest enemy is level 8. Battle Toaster being level 1, trying to kill something at level 8 is definitely hard. Did Jinx die? Is she just wounded? Jinx is down, and that's game. Okay, so when we die, it's not game over. You've been discovered by the wandering witch in the cemetery. She's taken you back to your house, but, you, but also charged you 10% of your current gold for saving your life. You're restored. Okay. We forgot to check how much money we had. Let's plant cabbage seeds. Strawberry seeds. I mean, this entire game, like, I wish, uh, like, it's so hard, it's so much harder to, to make all of this stuff without these menus, right? I want to make it so that you use the mouse. I'm not gonna plant all eight, just half of them. And we'll buy these, these trees. Like, that, that menu works, right? One text with the show text. That works fine. But when you have to select from, like, say, all of your inventory or something, it just makes more sense that you have a show picture and you do it with pictures instead of, like, a, a menu that goes through all of your 
even the shop. I, w I would like for the player to have a different inventory system. Let's buy some stone. Fishing pole. Raw fish. Let's press E. Let's move our rations. But only have one ration left. So we gotta fix that. So they'll start working. More pictures and picture, click picture type stuff? Yeah, exactly, Doctor. I wanna use less text menu and more actual, like, clicky. And, you know, like moving, you can move with the mouse, which is good. It's, it's inferior to moving with the keyboard, but still, uh, you can do it. But I want more of the game to, to work around. To work around using the mouse in pictures instead of so many menus. Because I'm like I'm noticing a similar theme. You want to plant stuff? Go through the menus. You want to enchant your weapon? Go through the menus. You want to um, you want to process foods? Go through the menus. Right? This is every RPG Maker game. Well, not every. This is 90% of RPG Maker games. Right? Just menu, 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 menu. So that my game is not special in that way, or more annoying in that way. What I wanted to do is, is stand out more. And I think to do that I have to make it look nicer. Also like a regrow function. Like do you want to repeat the same thing after you're done harvesting? Like when you harvest, it says to harvest your cabbage. Regrow more cabbage? Replant, and then if you say yes, it goes through all the menus for you, and then boom, it just replants. So that's another idea. We're doing some conceptualizing for uh, for polishing and, and rebuilding systems and upgrading systems in this episode. Taking a look at the game where it's at right now, and figuring out how to improve the game. I would like to make some sort of random variance with with uh, with crafting, so the player doesn't have to get like this item that says adds fire to your your attacks, and then that specific item just gives fire to your attacks. I would like to make an item that adds a random variant element to your attacks, and then it makes that weapon. You know, like say, it'll give you from one to five different random elements, and then if you want to change it, you have to use that currency again, that that crafting item again. So I'm gonna look at a plugin right now. It was a good run through. The random encounter system works perfect. It works fine. I didn't see any problems with it. The player has a warning; they'll never get double battles really quick. It'll always be between 40 and 50 steps, and if that feels oppressive later on when I'm beta testing, I'll raise the number, so it's 60 to 70 steps or whatever. The reason why this the 40, 30, 40 steps feels oppressive in game is because of the way that the random number generator works inside of MV, the way that the random battles work. It actually has a chance to start a battle the step after you get out of battle, even with like 999 steps. There's a chance that you get out of battle, the next step is another battle, because of the pick the number between one and the maximum number of steps mechanic, the way it works. We, we've completely curtailed that problem, right? By removing random encounters 
quote unquote in the game and then making a common event play when we walk on a tile a region and have that painted all the places we can walk this also gives us the ability to make certain areas that do not have random encounters just by changing the region so we have a lot more control over getting into combat and uh, stopping the player from um, from getting like constantly hit with random encounter random encounter it'll be very consistent the player will get used to the flow and if the flow is too grindy we can change the numbers like I said but anyway so that's fixed for here one other problem is the player if they decide to wander in here they can die very easily because they can get attacked by a pair of the highest level monsters even from the beginning of the graveyard so I don't want to make the player required to go through the graveyard especially not at the beginning of the game and as I make more enemies I need to update the variable number over here so that it picks a random number between one and the maximum number of troops so I have eight enemies now each troop is a combination of either one or two of that enemy I could even add more combinations where they're mixed together but I don't want to mix the enemies together except for like challenges or boss battles. I'm not a fan of jump scare either, Doc Weez. I don't mind if the game has a single jump scare in the whole game, like one. You can give me, you can have one and I'll forgive you. But if there's more than one, the story, the atmosphere, everything better be spectacular another bat jumps out at me I'm gonna just turn your your video game off or your movie off and you know what the thing is with jump scares it's the volume it's it's the volume it's if it's super loud oh it must be scary then right because it was super loud that doesn't make sense and I wish people would stop doing that loud does not equal scary it's, it startles you, but not the type of scary that you want to put in the game. What's my opinion of Five Nights at Freddy's? I don't know. I mean, it's okay at what it does. It's not my genre. If you like that genre, then it's great. If you don't like that genre, then you won't play it, pretty much. So, I mean... I'm okay with the play as the, the villain type thing in games. There's a game called Evil Quest that I enjoyed. It was like a Nintendo, it was a PC version of the, a Nintendo remake game. If you've ever played Crystallis on the NES or on an emulator, it's like that but on PC and you're the, and you're the villain, not the hero. So it was kind of cool. I think they, they're making a second one too. I miss the unsettling horror like visually horrific rather than BAM! Loud fear shock that hard sound. Yeah. I, I agree, Doc. Omni Slash says, I have random encounters because as evidenced by you, Drifty, everyone will just avoid enemies. So you're just forcing them to fight? That's okay, Omni, you can do that, but I would also caution you to allow the player to run. Go into the, um, the plugins that you're using, if you're using any, uh, or give the players a lot more agility, if you're not using plugins, than, than the enemies that you encounter. That way they get to go first, so they don't get in combat, then they get hit by five enemies, and then they fail to run, so frustrating so so frustrating but if you know the player is going to run you don't know that but if you did know they're forcing them into a battle probably not a good game design decision forcing them into a battle just for the sake of battle but if it's I don't know you know RPGs typically are around that so the player would kind of expect that I don't know it's a case by case but but definitely 
make it so that the player is able to run away at a reasonable rate if you're doing the random encounters and don't don't have the encounter rate very high make the maps bigger so the player can explore more and um, make it so that there's less steps I mean there, there, there's be, wait there's more steps between encounters so the player can walk around more and get into um, they can see more between battles. I think you get what I'm saying. Doc Wees makes a good point. I think RPGs need more viable options to gain experience rather than just combat. Totally, totally. So many of them fall on the crutch, the you have to fight to level up type thing. But that's not every game. A lot of games give you points for crafting. In fact, I like your idea, Doc Wees. And in that I'm going to award experience points for other things. I'm going to start, that's a great idea. For like say the farming system and repeatable systems, I'm going to award experience points for when the player successfully harvests something. Let's do that now, that's a great idea. Should I do it in the common event or on the event? I should do it in the common event. Well, it depends. It depends. I definitely don't want it to be an automated thing where you stand there and level up, because there's already ways, that's how you get your a lot of items in the game. So it'd have to be like when the player is forced to go through menus to, to use the system, reward the player for their time spent. So I don't want to make it an automated, you get experience. So we'll do it through the events themselves in town. Makes sense that way. So it would be these events on the side that come that are moved to replace it. It says, do you want to harvest them? If so, you've obtained this and experience. And we can copy paste the same pattern through all these. So it shouldn't be too much work. We won't have to do it eight times. We'll just make it and then we'll copy paste it for each event. Drifty give experience through running away and or dying. Is it not an experience? Some would say that you get more experience for failing. The problem is people will do what gives them the most experience to level. And is the experience of dying fun? I never want to incentivize the unfun thing. That's bad game design. But I see where you're going, the Cajun one. And losing a battle or running away from a battle could also yield something but maybe not as much. I'm, I'm all for putting more little incremental experience bonuses throughout the game for more arbitrary things. So we can do that. I'm just trying to devise how I want to do this in the, the actual um, ima amounts because now I have to take a look at the curves, the level curves. So I'm doing level times 300 <clears throat> times level times 0.75. So at one, you've got what, 225. At two, you've got 600 times 1.5. So 
So that's a huge disparity between one and two. At level three, you've got 900 times three times 0.75. So it's 225 times 2.25, 2,000. Then you've got 1,200 times four. It's 28. All right, 0.75 times 4 is 3 times 1,200. You're at 3,600. So that's, that's, I like that curve. And it gets increasingly larger. So should I base the amount of experience you get off of the, the player's level? Or should it be a... A set amount. I feel like it should be a set amount. Running away gives 10% of the experience, 25% for knockout. Plus they're losing coin for for being knocked out, right. Yeah, I'm not going to reward uh, running away with a percentage of the fight, because that would be complicated, one. And two, you can just fight hard enemies and run from them to get... Like like I said, that wouldn't be a fun thing to start a battle to run, to start a battle to run, you know, with a hard enemy that would sometimes one-shot them. That seems like a, um, a tedious task to power level yourself. So I don't want to incentivize this type of exploit because it's not fun gameplay. And mechanically, it would be complicated, right? How do you, you'd have to reference the battle each time, depending on what, with a, with a set of conditions. If it was this enemy, then that. If it was this enemy, then that. And also, what if you decide midway through the game, which you're going to, that this enemy gives not enough experience, or this enemy doesn't give enough experience? Well, then you have to go back into your subsystem and change those numbers. It's just a big spaghetti nightmare. So, take care, OmniSlash. Have fun. I think I'm gonna go with the set amount. It makes it makes the most sense because it, at the beginning of the game, it will really give the player a good boost. But towards the end of the game, the player will have to find more solid measures of getting experience. Um, just repeating the same task over and over and over and over is that you're gonna get diminishing returns because your your requirement to level goes up, but the amount that you get goes stays the same. So that's the that's the method I'll take. So early on, farming and these other tasks like running away from combat will give you a good amount of experience, a decent amount, to get you started. But towards higher levels, it seems like a small little drop in the pond. So let's do that. Let's do set amounts. Once the player goes to harvest, if they say harvest now, then we're going to get the items, but before it shows the player, we're going to, with the show text, we're going to control the new variable. We're gonna call this variable farm experience. And we'll set farm experience, which is variable 85, <clears throat> to a random number between 100 and 500. Is that too much? So you're gonna do eight times. That's gonna be 4,000 experience. Let's do 100 and 300. <clears throat> 2,000 experience. It'll be a whole level of, no, because at, like eventually 500. That's a big range. And it'll be a lot at the beginning of the game, sure. 
but once you get to like level 10, it'll be like nothing. I mean, it'll still be something, but it won't be as much. All right, so what we're going to do is change the party's experience. Change experience by increasing using increasing the experience based on a variable, the farm experience, and show if they level up. I wish there was a condition here for like when they actually level up, if they do level up, like have another thing that says add condition, you check the box, and then it opens up a, a like conditional statement. And the, and the the case would be if the players level up, if a player levels up. So if a player levels up, then do this. So that you can reward the player or show an extra animation or do whatever you wanna do if the player actually levels up. Whitely, that's a good idea. A lot of games do that now. That they, they give you the experience and give you the max level pretty quick. And then to actually get the big growth, you have to upgrade your gear, which I do like that idea. Or applying achievements and giving um, like permanent bonuses for achievements. That's a good idea. Oh no, Doc says, don't speak of that game, please. I'll never get my $2,000 nor a decade of my life back from that game. $2,000? Ooh, Doc, they got your number. They got your number real good. Whatever game that was, the game whose name we shall not say. Two grand, huh? That's a pretty good one. <laughs> Mabin, no, I'm gonna say it. No trauma. I bet. Must have been pretty fun though, huh? I was young and a fool. That's the problem with uh, the current state of the industry. AAA games are just full of loot boxes. They just prey upon young minds, and not even young minds, just vulnerable minds. Right, especially if they have like gambling addictions. The whole industry. Damien, what's up, dude? How are you doing today? How's your day going? Did you have a good weekend? How's the project? Triple A games, what I was talking about. It's it's ridiculous, the state of triple A games. It's it's all about milking a, a fraction of their audience for as much as they possibly can, preying on that gambling addiction. They're preying on an addiction to make money, and it's really sad. Loot boxes, loot boxes. And even if they're not called loot boxes, the same mechanics are incorporated. You slept for 15 and a half hours? Holy crap, dude. I slept for six hours because I had a messed up schedule over this week and I kept going to bed like at 3 a.m. and then waking up in the, in the noon, like 12. So having to get back up at 9 for my regular schedule was really hard today. So I only got like six hours of sleep, maybe five and a half. But normally I get seven or eight. So I bet that felt good. I'm glad you made it to the stream. Thanks for coming. Well, it's your own fault for wanting to pay for a free-to-play game. Petya, but you don't understand. The games are designed to not be as enjoyable or, or like, they curve the player in a direction to where you would kind of need to, to pay at least a certain amount to have a standard average experience. Like, especially when the game is really good. They'll make a really good game, but then they'll... It's not like you're, it used to be years ago when they would have systems like this, and it would be like, it was a completely different animal. The 15 and a half hours was after only getting four hours, four hours of sleep from Thursday to Sunday. Yeah, I bet there was a huge sleep debt. Probably a huge sleep debt. 
I mean, I guess even years ago, games had the same sort of uh, mechanics that were gambling. So that was a that was a moot point. But but they're very um, what's the right word? Predatory. The mechanics that they use in these games are very predatory. I'm not faulting players for spending money on microtransactions because the games are geared to make them so tempting. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming the industry for making it that way. It's like, think about this. Like a young kid and you're tempting them with candy. That's what they're doing. And you give the kids so much candy that they get a stomach ache. You know, that, that's what the industry is doing, really. But instead of giving candy, they're taking money for that candy. They're, they're charging them like $20 for this lollipop. You know, it's, it's like uh, the game gives you the free-to-play experience. It's like a drug dealer who's getting their audience addicted to their game and then charging them a premium to get the, to play, to get the play style they want. It's very predatory and it's a dangerous state for the industry. The AAA industry is just a cesspool. It's a garbage bin right now. And a lot of company a lot of companies, a lot of countries are starting to say, no, this is illegal. This is clearly a gambling thing. Uh, I forgot what com- what country it was, but not too long ago, there's laws that ban loot boxes. Because it's just, it's it's basically a gambling scheme. Exactly, Cajun. Maybe giving the candy. That's a good way. Tempting them, taking their money, and then maybe giving them some candy for it. And that's called the Skinner Box effect too, because you don't know if you're going to get the thing you wanted, and that's more tempting than the than guaranteeing that you'll get the thing you wanted. It, it's, it's kind of crazy to understand, but this is how it works. Because not always getting what you want and, and getting garbage a lot of times makes it so much, makes your brain release so much more dopamine when you actually get the thing that you didn't have a guaranteed shot at getting. And the Skinner Box effect itself isn't a bad thing, but when it takes your credit card number to run through the Skinner Box, that's when it becomes predatory, right? Because every RPG uses the Skinner Box effect. Do you have a sword that doesn't drop every time? Well, that's the Skinner Box effect. You know, you fight the enemy over and over to get it to drop the magic sword. But what is is the player spending? Their time for enjoyment and then uh, the dopamine rush when they get the sword, right? But if they, if you're making the player pay for an a, a imaginary thing that they have a chance at getting, then they're just, pred- they're just preying on, on the mind of that person, right? And the wallet. They're not really giving much enjoyment. They're giving a excitement release of dopamine for money, which I suppose is something, but it's just not right. It's really not right. So, I don't know. I'm a huge indie game um, flag bearer, right? Screw these big studios making these huge games that are just designed to milk people for all they're worth. Nintendo has a lot of copyright problems and crazy practices, I agree. But at least they're not as bad when it comes to like their shops and their microtransactions. They're still making great games that don't have um, loot box pay to win as you know aspects in it. Their games are still incredibly expensive and they maintain their value for a long time. Indies are getting dangerously close to corporations. Some are lightly, but not all. The majority are not like that. I think, uh, what was that one game where you have, like, the mask on, and it's like, uh, it's like a horror psychological thriller, and it was an indie game, but then a corporation bought it? Uh, We Happy Few. Here's a, here's an example of that happening, Whiteley, I agree with you. 
I don't know if they do microtransactions, but it's a similar story in a way that a publisher bought the, I don't know the whole story, a publisher got the hold of the rights for the game. So they paid the indie studio for their game, and they were going to release their game for 15 bucks, is what I can understand, from what I understand. It was going to be a $15 indie title. They, a big studio bought it, they threw some more uh, money at the, um, at something, or maybe they didn't do that. A studio bought it, and now it's 60 bucks. Like, what? What? $60 for this game? It was fantastic looking, because it was an indie title, and it was like a psychological thing, and, but, but once, the, once the publisher bought it, they, the indie studio lost their rights to really do it the way that it, they wanted to do it and had to be homogenized in a certain way that would get some sort of more mass appeal and probably had to follow more strict guidelines so that they couldn't have certain scenes that would be a little bit too far and maybe make this, the game even more memorable. And they quadrupled the price. Be happy bugger out for money, yep. I mean, that's old news, but I saw it on the, the Steam sale. Oh, I wanted to ask you guys, what games are you guys buying for the, is it still going on? It's still going on for a day, another day, the Steam sale. You guys buy anything good? I bought two games so far on this uh, Steam Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Thanksgiving, whatever you want to call it, American Corporation Holiday, whatever. If there were sales on Steam, I bought two games. I bought a an old game. Chiefy, you bought a Sprite? Fantastic purchase. Fantastic. Doc Wee's bought Divinity 2. That's a great game. It's a very, very good game. I bought an old title called Arcanum for $1.49. And I remember playing this game for hours and hours and hours, like 15 years ago or whatever. It came out a long time ago, but, and it's only like six bucks, but it was marketed down to a dollar fifty, and I was like, I've gotta pick this game up. And I played it for like 45 minutes, and I'm like, yeah, I don't, it's not as good as it was. The memory of playing the game is always gonna trump the uh, actual experience of it. It's always gonna be better than the experience uh, now, but I, I still like it. Um, but I was reading there's mods now that you can get for it to improve the game and fix some bugs So I may um, download some mods for this old title Damien spent his money on figures from Tokyo Otaku mode You spent 600 US Ooh, That's that's a that's a pretty penny there You should post some pictures of them Shizumi bought Pixel Game Maker. Careful with the rose-colored glasses effect with old games. It's true, Alexander, because when I played it, I was like, whoa, this resolution, though. <laughs> it's. I remember it not being in a small window, but it's, it's amazing how much has happened in the last, what, 15 years? The resolution size went from a box like this to like a huge box, right? Yeah, I think it was like 800 by 600 or 640 by 480 or something like that. And yeah, it's still a fun game, though. I mean, the storyline in Arcana was very fantastic. Was fantastic. I don't think you used the. Anyway, what was I doing? I'm making an experience system. We got we got thrown on a tangent here. Chibi says I actually have a question about Ace Sprite. Shoot, let's hear it. Maybe somebody in the in the chat could help. I'm not no expert on Ace Sprite, but I've been using it quite often. What was the other game I bought? Um, Star Wars: Empires at War. It was it's normally twenty bucks, and it was like seventy percent off or sixty-five percent off. So it was like $6 or something like that. 
So I bought Star Wars Empires at War. It's a strategy game. It's pretty good. I mean, it's an old, like 10 year old strategy game. Even older than that. I think it's like 12 years old. But for being 12 years old, it's pretty solid. And I played that for a couple hours, but once again, I was like, eh. You know, kind of got bored real quick. Shizumi says Empire at War was an awesome game. I played it way too long. Yeah, I imagine I'll play that one some more. So those are the two games that I picked up so far. I think I think that's pretty much what I'm going to get for this sale. Not too bad, didn't break the bank. A $6 game, maybe a $7, $6.99, and a $150, not $50, $1.50 title, $149. Arcanum. So the question, Cheapy says, I wanna make a more walking sprites, do you just add them and switch them with the events, or is there another way? Such as kneeling in different sleeping positions. Okay, I know what you're saying. Yeah, um, basically, you're going to have multiple sprites for each thing, right? So you're going to have the regular walking sprite that you're using most of the time, but when the player goes into a kneeling, you have to make that sprite separately. So you'll, you'll make your sprite where the player is walking. He likes to, he's flying. He's a flying sprite. So you have your normal sprite where the player is flying or walking. And they'll, they'll all have three frames of animation. But you know, you'll do this till you have 12 frames. One is facing down, one is facing left, I think first. Let me find the, let's go to game open folder and take a look at an example of a character. I guess any of these will work. So you have the one where the character is facing down. Then you have them facing left, then you have them facing right, then you have them facing up, and this is an, the next image, right? So you can have them all in one sprite sheet and, and don't have a, a, a exclamation point and a dollar sign in front of it. And then in the next set, you'll have three more frames. I would, I prefer to put them in separate sheets so that I can just change the sheet. So I mean, I would do it that way. So you have another sheet where the player is like doing their kneeling animation. So you would have them standing up and then halfway kneeled and then all the way kneeled. And then, you know, you can have that as play through the animations with a move event. And then the next three, you can have it like a laying down where he's like this direction, this direction, and this direction. So you can have them like moving over or rolling and what you'll do in game is an event right here where you, let me find it for you. Where is it actually at? Which you'll have to do 
to make that work. So you have separate sprite sheets. Here it is. It, inside of the event commands on the third page under the system settings section, you have a thing called change actor images. And what you'll do is select the character sprite and you'll change it to something different, right? Oh, I get it, thanks. It's okay, yeah, right? And you use the, this thing and you select the other image and then once you change the image, you do a, a movement route, like inside your event, if you're having a scene where he's kneeling down or whatever to pick something up, you do a movement route where this player, uh, these are arbitrary, it depends, these are just referencing the, 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 the sprite, right? So move down, move left, or you would do turn. You can just have them turn. So turn down is the first set of three images, because that's gonna make them face down. This, and then turn left is the second set of images, turn right is the third set of images, and turn up is the fourth set of images, right? So they're actually organized in a manner that reflects the way it's referencing the PNG file. So you, which animation do you wanna use? You wanna, you can have like the rolling over, kneeling, or, or doing the whatever in a set of four rows of three animations and then you can call those animations by turning this 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 and if you want to animate that all you have to do is change the walking animation or stepping animations so you can have them turn down and then walking animation on and you can even control control the um, the speed and the frequency how fast do you want that to happen So you would just go through that process. I need to get this system set up here. So we're going to give the player a random amount of experience for harvesting their crops between 100 and 500 and reference that amount as well in here. You've obtained those items and variable 85 because that's what we're using to, to store the farm experience. It'll call whatever number it picked, and that much experience for harvesting. So we don't need a separate show text. All we need to do is add this line. Copy this. Okay, I see we're gonna have to go through this in two stages and change two things the first thing what we're gonna that we're going to do since, since this is a different text each time what if I just do a gab window I can just copy paste one time through four, four separate pages on eight events it's 32 copy paste that I'll save myself the time of doing Okay, we'll just go like this. We can keep that the same. And say, you've gained that much experience for harvesting crops. Or 
or we can just incorporate this bit of code into the gap window that's already being called. Where's our gap window? Is it in the common events? We can give the player the experience Okay, so it'll say one of your plants has finished growing um, on the gap window when it's ready, but then when you harvest it, it shows text. So we can reference the gap window again at this point to let them know that they got experience. I'm just gonna put this in a comment for right now because I have to do some other copy pasting and I don't wanna have to type it. I'm a lazy man. I'm a lazy man. So I'm going to take the gap text, copy the gap text, paste it here, take this text. Boom, you gain this much experience for harvesting crops. We also need to force gab. And we should probably play a sound too, because why not? Let's do a sound effect for it. Copy this. That's a pleasant sound effect. Okay. Okay, DG, exclamation point, DG underscore B flat ukulele chord. B flat ukulele. No spaces. Okay. Nice. And it'll show the text and also force the gap. This makes it easy on me because now I can copy this. Wait, you know what? We'll force gab right here. That way I can just copy this block. Farm experience control variable change the experience with that variable, showing the level up. Let's do this showing the level up after we do this. Paste. Yeah. From the start, it will pick a number. We don't need this comment now. Prepare the text. Ooh, I found a, a bug there. I'm glad I didn't copy paste it first. 85, not 86. You've gained the farm experience for harvesting crops. Play, prepare a sound and then play, force the sound in text. Ch give the player that experience, which will cause the thing to say you leveled up if you did. 
and then you've obtained this much item, this many cabbages or whatever. This will be the same, or this will be different for each one of these, right? It'll be cabbages, carrots, whatever. But all of the experience that we're adding into, now it's in a format that I can copy paste over and over and it's not a lot of work. I'm just making sure it's correct. That's why I went through it two or three times. Because I'm gonna propagate it and I'm placing it underneath the change items. And it should be exactly the same. Cool. And I'll methodically go through, put this like this. Oh, you know what I could do? I'm gonna backtrack a bit. What if I wanna change that number? I'll have to go through 32 contents. When you have something like this, farm experience reward, you wanna make a common event and call that common event. That's the what you, that's what you wanna do. And then you change the common event and you change 32 instances of what happens there. Okay, so I'm going to backtrack and I'm going to remove this stuff carefully. <laughs> Darn it. Well, at least I caught this now, right? From the control variable to the change experience. And work our way back. How do I make that work? You just call the common event. So we go new, common event. And we select the one we just created. And we copy this common event. And we paste that. Now say we don't want to to award 100 to 500 or 300, we want to change that number for any reason. We just change the common event and it changes all of these events. Much more sustainable of a workflow. Now we need to test it. Let's see. That was that was a little consuming. I was so let me just check it. Jeez. 
TP says, if you want to make a more walking sprite, do you just add them and switch them with events, or is there another way? If you want to make a more walking sprites. I'm not sure what you mean, Chiefy. To add more frames, you really have to do something different. But if you want to have, like, more types of animations, you just create more, more sheets. You just create more animation sheets with the same format, right? Four rows and three columns. You get three animations per uh, thing. You can even have it, yeah, you definitely want to animate it. Like, if they're going to kneel, you want to start the first frame based on the, the, uh, the walking sprite. So if they're walking and they look a specific way, you want to have the first frame kind of look like that walking sprite a little bit. Maybe a little bit different for like, and then, and then change the next two frames to really make the in-between and then the final resting kneeling position. You just add more and you use that thing I just showed you in the contents of an event to do a move event and then you can transition from the sprite sheet to sprite sheet. Okay, such as kneeling in different sleeping positions. Yeah, just make more sprite sheets and then change the character sprite sheet and do a move, of, move event and then do the opposite, right? Um, change the character sprite again. You can even reverse the movement. So if they kneel, then you re you you kind of do another movement uh, event, but you just reverse the order so they go backwards, and then you change it back to the in the movement, like the walk sprite sheet. I think I scrolled up too much. We already we already went over that. <laughs> Natural explorers pacifist run only farm and get to max level without fighting. That's that sounds like an option. What if max level is 999? I mean, you won't need to get max. You won't need to get 999. Alright, so it shouldn't matter what plot we use, we should just plant something. Let's put, let's see how much experience you get. And it shouldn't matter what plants you're actually putting down. I should also amend this to add a, an else handler. So if it doesn't pick a specific thing, it's, it should say, you can't plant that. So the player knows that they didn't actually start something. Strawberry seeds. Like what if they're like, oh, I want to plant carrots, so they put fresh carrot instead of carrot seeds, since they have the same icon, that could be confusing. So in the instance that they say, let's plant a pickaxe, it should say, you cannot plant that. I'll add that and touch up the system. are growing they're 51% of the way done really already 56 I kind of feel like uh, 
That was really fast for growing. I mean, it's good for this beta testing. Maybe I'll add duration. The time it takes to slowly plant all of your crops, by the time you get done, you you've, the first one you started is halfway done. That seems like it's a little too fast. It's fine for now. I think I'll, I'll add some duration to that before it's done. If people in World of Warcraft leveled up only by harvesting flowers, <laughs> only two gamers can get to 999 by farming. Okay, so when we harvest this, harvest them? Yeah. You've obtained two fresh carrots. Did it say? Ah, oh, okay, hold up. I didn't see where it showed the text because the gap window is really populated with a lot of things. One of your plants is finished growing, so we get a gap window notification there. Plants are going 100% of the way to harvest them. One of your plants finished growing. You gained 484 experience for harvesting crops. It does tell you. Okay. 334 experience for harvesting crop. We got level 3. Two hundred nineteen experience. Two hundred twenty five experience. So going through the entire if you plant eight and harvest eight, you'll get almost level four. It's very it, it varies, right? Because it can go from anywhere from one hundred to five hundred. So we'll say on it, I don't know if that's an average amount, but three or four or five. Probably won't go to level five. You'll get to level four right at the beginning, which is a good start. Which is a really good start. But you would also, I mean, are you going to have those seeds at the start? Probably not. You'll have to find those seeds. So it wouldn't really make a huge difference. But what we should do is let the player buy seeds from a vendor. Should the seed vendor, I mean, the traveling merchant can sell the seeds, but what if I make a different map on the world map, like say right here, uh, a, a little camp right here. This is a livestock farm, so that's not going to be where you get the seeds. I also want to incorporate fertilizer being a thing that could give you more experience and or items. Maybe this second village here will have a merchant that sells seeds. No, I feel, I feel like they should be in this first town. We just need an NPC that sells seeds here. Don't we? This area is used by the blacksmith. This area is a building. The tinkerer shop will appear here once you rescue Devin. You know what? There needs to be an NPC right here, right here, by these flowers, that sells seeds. So who's going to be our, our seed selling NPC? Let me make an NPC right here. New NPC. 
We've already got Eric Sanders somewhere. We've got Irving somewhere. Maybe Wasif. Yeah, let's use Wasif. Wasif, you're gonna be our seed vendor. Wasif the seed seller. I nominate Heartless Angel for the seed vendor. <laughs> I don't think she would want to be that. She very specifically said she wanted to be... Wait, what did she say? Something about like an evil character that is a hard fight or gives the character an item or something. I don't think Heartless would be satisfied being the, just a seed vendor. You can find the seed vendor in the dungeon. I kind of like that. Vapor, you want to be the seed vendor? I made you a toaster, you owe me. <laughs> okay, okay, Vapor is the seed vendor. And the, he will appear after rescuing Vapor the seed seller, yeah. Thanks again for helping me out of the dungeon. Out of that cave. And that's all it needs to say, and it'll do shop processing. Carrot seed. Potato seeds. Strawberry seeds. Is there an Alexander Sprite? <laughs> She's an evil seed. Doc I'm still an NPC stuck in limbo. Wait, Vapor, do you want to be the... the seed vendor? I was going to make Wasif the, the seed vendor. Or do you want to be the town, the ship builder? Doc Weez wanted to be the ship builder, but you're the enchanter man's.
I'm the one who wins. <laughs> okay, is this all right, Vapor? You gotta answer me, bro. You made me the, the epic toaster, battle toaster, so I'm giving you precedence because you've contributed a a piece of art. Three of them, actually. A face sprite. A battler sprite, even. I do have the blacksmith. I don't have the alchemist yet, Damien. Do you want to be the alchemist? I have to resize some sprites, but that's not a big deal. I actually need to make notes now because my brain is limited. Limited resources. Quick notes. Will be the alchemist sprite. Vapor will be the ship builder sprite. Doc Weez is enchanter man sprite. I'll have to reference this later. Okay, this is gonna be with Steve then. Cause I already have the sprite made and everything. Damien, do you have a specific sprite you want? You can shoot that over on Discord if you want me to use a specific one. I sent that before you gave me the position. What do you mean sent? You like being the seed man? Okay. All right, Vapor. You're gonna be the seed man. <laughs> Should I say Vapor the seed man? I think that works better. <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks again for helping me out of the cave. But now I need to make a sprite for Vapor. Vapor Wave the Seed Man. Why Vapor Wave? Is that his name in the Discord? Is that your name in the Discord, Vapor? Vaporwave the Seed Man. I'm the Seed Boy. I'm the one who plants or, or boats, builds boats, whatever Drifty wants at this point. All right, well, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Vaporwave, okay. Let's make a sprite for Vapor. Well, that's what it is now. You want to make it vapor? Okay, go for it. Um, keep in mind that I'm resizing it using a, like a Photoshop thing. I'm using a, like for example, let me show you how I'm doing it. So if you make it, use the generator, right? Make, use the generator because I can resize it to the, the taller sprite. Let's see, who else do I need to make a sprite? I have Doc Wee's, don't I? I already got Doc. Yeah, I have Doc. Where did I put Doc Wee's? I put I I put Doc Wee's somewhere on the map.
Devin Scott is here in this little dungeon. He's the tinkerer. These are just the random dungeon generation maps. I need to put uh, Doc Wee's somewhere to unlock the enchanting system. So I don't want to overload the player with all of the systems at the beginning of the game. So they're going to be turned off, but, but easily turned... Easily uh, activated. Oh, here we go. The Enchanter Man. Okay, I'll, I'll just make it so that you talk when you talk to him here, he activates it. So before the self switch, we'll do a show text that's dim middle. And it says, you've activated the enchanting system. And then we'll do a sound effect. Play sound effect. have to be a giant fanfare it could be one key press and we'll have this turn on a switch so it's very easily activated you go into the, the school you talk to Doc Wee's and he lets you enchant stuff now we'll make a new switch and we'll call this enchanting system toggle and we'll turn it on here and then all we have to do in the player's house is put a switch condition chanting system toggle so as soon as the switch is on it'll be here and if it's not it won't be there at the beginning so the player will see this th without something there first and then when they talk to him they'll notice that it's there okay that's done Damien, you have full creative freedom. If, if you're gonna... You can make it whatever you want, pretty much. I would prefer that you give me a sprite with the character generator, because it'll be easy on you for one, and two, it'll be easy for me to stretch it out. Because the big heads, I have a little method to make them taller and reduce the head size. So whatever setting you want, whatever generator parts that you want to use is fine. But I'll show you the process now that we've got Doc Wee's. Who, who else would, do I need to make? We did uh, the one for Doc Wee's. Go back to the, this map. Vapor, right? This is not the one for Vapor. This is with Seif. We need one for Vapor. But Vapor said he was going to make... Vapor's going to make his own. Okay. That crazy haunting song is back. I know, I need to get better music, but so many things give me copyright claims. A lot of my videos are copyright claimed because I use um, music that should be copyright free, but for some reason it's not. 
Like, even when it says, copyright free music for your streams, it gets claimed. And I'm like, what the... So, you gotta be careful when you're when you're using music on YouTube. That's another idea. If I use Twitch, I won't have to worry about that. The downside is, people who don't see it live are gonna miss all of the stuff because it's not going to be rebroadcasted for more than like a few days. Was it 90 days that it's, that it's up? On, on YouTube, it's cataloged for a long time. Okay, so Vapor, you're, you want to create your own sprite, but this is the seed vendor. So until you make your own sprite and send me your own sprite, the seed vendor is going to have a different sprite. I'm going to make generic seed vendor. Do you already have it made? You're gonna send it on Discord? Oh, nice, excellent. Okay, cool, let me open this up, save this image as, and we're gonna put this inside of, sets. There's vapor space. And then we're going to take this one and save this image as vapor inside of characters. Vapor default. So the process I go through, let me open it in here. For the characters. Is I, I open the PNG and then I run it through this set of commands that I made. This was information I learned from Royal Crown Code. He showed me a cool method to change the sizes by stretching it out and stretching the head size, stretching everything and then reducing the head size, which like I could do and I thought, okay, well, I just don't want to do that. It's going to be a lot of work. But he showed me a way to make save that as a script and then run it as a script. So all I have to do is select this script that I made and hit play. And you see how it stretched it out? So what it basically did was it changed the image size to give it 50% 50 per, 50 more Y dimension and stretched out all of these um, uh, sprites by giving making it 50% taller. But then it reduces the size of the head from 100% to 75%. So it stretches it out and reduces the size of the head, and then it automatically saves it as well. So if I hit OK, save the database, and I go in here, I can go to Vapor. Where did I save it? Vapor default. And even though it shows this chibi sprite, because that's what it was in as, as first. Why is it showing the chibi sprite? I think it's just because the database is already loaded as a chibi. Let me, let me start here and make sure that it's actually the full size sprite. It shouldn't be chibi, it should be the full size sprite. 
Nope, it's chibi. Why is it chibi? Did it not save it? Oh, it encountered an error. I told it to stop if it has if it runs into an error. And I've have I have it continuing to um, stretch out the sprite of the 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 fallen images. Let me close this over here. And so, because it stopped right here in the transform this layer, it didn't get to the save. But all I have to do is save this as something. I actually don't want to have a selection. I just want to save as the entire image. And we're going to call this Vapor Seed Vendor. Seed Man. <laughs> so now we won't overwrite it. But the reason why I did it this way is so that it'll look correct when we go in here. Because it won't change the chibi because it already like found it. But now it'll show the full size right. And you see the difference? The chibi sprite where they're kind of squished and then the full size they're taller. and But the head size didn't get much bigger. It got really really stretched out but the head size only got marginally bigger. So they become less chibi and more like fitting, in my opinion. <laughs> Will you do a tutorial of using Octopath Traveler Battle System? Do you really need a tutorial? It's pretty simple. You just kind of put it in. Just have to do what Jim Sterling does, create copyright deadlock. Yeah, I could do that, Doc, but then I don't get ad revenue either, you know? And it's not a lot, but it really adds up after a while, and I sort of need ad revenue. As small as it is, I need it. I'll just copyright the word copyright. It worked for React, didn't it? <laughs> Do you remember when the Fine Bros tried to copyright? <laughs> they tried to copyright React videos. We see this as an opportunity. Man, they bled so many subs. Poor guys. They made a wrong business decision and they quickly backtracked. There we have Vaporwave the Seed Man. Thanks again for helping me out in the cave. And he sells us the seeds we need. Carrots, potatoes, strawberries, and cabbage seeds. This will get us started at the beginning of the game for the player to get some experience and start their pacifist run. Can you do a weapon that will gain attack whenever you kill a monster with it? Didn't you ask me this like a million times in the past? I think I see, I've seen this before. Yes, you know what, that's easy. Let's do that. Let me save my project. Make a weapon that will gain attack whenever you kill monsters with it. Okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to weapons, and we're gonna create a new one, and we're gonna call it the Soul Slayer. And this weapon it takes the soul of the creature you kill. It's a red light sword. And killing creatures with this weapon increases its power. And then base value will be like, we'll say 10 attack, okay? Well, I'm gonna say strength, strength, plus 10, but you can say ATK plus 10 or whatever. And we're gonna start it with 10, right? Now what we're gonna need to do is install a plugin, Christian. It's called YEP underscore weapon unleash. You sent me everything? Awesome, let me check that out. Well, hey. More is better than less. All right, Christian, we're gonna get to it as soon as I get this uh, sprite sheet saved, okay? 
faces. Damien face it. Bada boom. Close this. Open original. Right click, save as. Go to characters. Damien walk sprite, save. Bada bing. Got it. Oh, you went. You made another one. Okay, hold up. Let me overwrite. Save this as sprite two. Close this. Close this. And then, of course, we need a battler. Save image. Damon Battler. This goes inside SV Actors. Damon Battler. Damien, how do you feel about being a character in the game, like a battle, like someone who can join the party? Ben says, I'm digging the RPG Maker MV Extended Generator by Schlangen since I suck at Photoshop. Extended Generator? Hmm, maybe I need to check that. More of a clerk. Okay, I hear you. I didn't send a battler because the toaster is my battler. <laughs> That's fine, Vapor. I recently got RPG Maker from the Humble Bundle not long ago and came across the series and really enjoying it. Saw you were live, so I wanted to thank you for the great. Awesome! SZ Halo, thank you. Thank you. You're awesome, dude. Okay, we got we got to get back to this tutorial. This long awaited tutorial for for Christian Micah. How do you make a sword that gets stronger with each thing you kill? So we're going to do a, we're going to do a weapon unleash. So the plugin we're going to need, Christian, is called yep underscore weapon unleash. So you're going to get, is this dependent on anything? I don't think it's dependent on, maybe the battle system, maybe a, a battle engine core. So you'll need core engine, battle engine core, and the weapon unleash. That's it. Very easy, right? So you take this plugin, and all we're going to do is use replace attack. And this can be applied on a weapon, right? So you've got it all, sweet. So go down and where it says replace attack, it's right at the beginning. Copy this little thing right here, and we're going to put this on the weapon as well. So it's saying replace it with this skill. So when you use this this attack, it'll do a custom attack. We put we put it in the note tag right there. We don't we're gonna leave it X right now because we don't have the skill. But we're gonna make the weapon and then we're gonna make the skill. You can make it do other stuff that you want over here, but it doesn't really need to do anything extra. We're just gonna make it start with 10 attack and gain extra attack for everything we kill. So we're gonna need to allocate one variable. We're gonna go to common events and we're gonna call this soul slayer level uh, power up so inside this you can call it whatever you want inside a common event we're going to do something very simple we're going to control a variable and we're going to add one or maybe it's in game data too hold on it might be in game data um, Battle count, win count. Maybe we need to use um, Buff State's core. Or maybe there's a variable 
hold on, I'm thinking of an easier way to do this. Maybe there's a variable that stores the number of creatures the player has killed. Let me, let me search the forum. Is there a game, or is there a variable in RPG Maker MV that stores the value of the number of creatures killed? If not, we'll just have to This actually won't work, because what if you kill stuff with other weapons, it'll still make the Soul Slayer stronger. That's not exactly what I was asked to do. So even if there is that variable, that's not what the player wants. Whenever you kill a monster with it, I feel like Yanfly did a tips and tricks on how to do this. What we'll have to do is some buff state score maybe. Let's make this skill, we'll make a skill. This is gonna call Soul Slayer Slash. Make it that red color and call it whatever you want. Give it any icon you want. And this is going to have a.atk times whatever you want, let's say four. Plus, we're going to have it store, uh, we're going to have it use a variable. So, this is the thing that we actually have to do. We're going to do a backslash and then a V, and then in the we're going to open up a bracket. And inside there, we're going to put the number of the variable we're going to use. So plus that times whatever. So we'll say extra 10 damage for every soul we've killed. But we're going to encapsulate. Do we need to do that? No. Because it's going to do this and then this and then add them together. King Critical, it has 20 var variants. And it'll have a normal attack deals extra damage for every soul that it's slayed. And since it's going to replace our basic attack, we're not going to make it cost anything. In fact, we're going to give it uh, the TP gain. We're going to make sure that it's like your basic attack gives you TP, so this also gives you TP. Yanfly has a video on it if you want the weapon to get stronger with the player, not based on monster kills. There is actually a tutorial on something like that from Yanfly with copying Nasus Siphon Strike from League of Legends. That combined with Doodads. Oh, Bobbin says something different. I'm in love with Yanfly's event sprite offset. That's the new one. Sounds cool. Totally not vapor. Hey guys, it's me. Totally not vapor. How are you? <laughs> we're good. We're good. I'm good. Let's see. We're going to use a note tag here. I guess we could, um, or maybe we'll just call a common event since we're storing a variable. Common event could increase the value of it every time it's um, every time the sword is used. So every time you hit something, it can go up. But what we actually need to do is something in the damage core, I believe. So let's go to the damage core and. Lunatic mode it up. If 
target if target.hp no it's not here not the damage core let's find weapon note tag Put it on a passive state if you're that you have while you're wearing the weapon. I think we'll do that. We're gonna make a passive state using yep above state score, and when you're wearing this weapon, you gain the state. So let's do this state first. Easy. We'll make a state, and this state right here will have whatever icon you want and we'll call it soul slayer so you have the soul slayer state it's not going to really do anything and it's not removed because it's going to be a passive state and on the weapon if you equip it you're going to get a state Passive state here, passive state. What number is that? I'm using 38, but you can use a different state. Whatever number you want. Just remember what number you use, and then on the weapon, put that number right there. So passive state 38. So this means we're gonna need another plugin that I'm not currently using. So let's get that plugin. Yep. Underscore. Alright now I did. Danfly.mo slash yep. And then control F passive. Scroll down, scroll down. Okay. It's called auto passive states. Okay, I'm gonna put a link in the in the chat for you, Miss Micah. And right click here, save this link as, and you want to put it in I no nope, not IMG, JS plugins folder. Bang. If you already have it, you can overwrite with the most recent version. You're gonna need that one. You can close that. Okay, and double click, find it on your list, auto passive states, yeah, and you just put passive state and then the number, you will need RPG Maker 1.5 or higher for this to work. I'm currently using 1.6.1, I think, so that should work fine. So I'm going to move this up underneath the skill core. So now, when we equip the Soul Slayer, we're going to gain state 38 automatically. Now this gives us control for the buff state's core, so we can add things that happen inside of combat. And the skill that we're using um, with the Soul Slash is a weapon replace. So we need to go weapon, or attack, replace. And now we're gonna put the skill number in right here. So the skill that I'm using, or wait, hold on, the weapon, as replace attack, and then we put the skill number right here. 
the skill number we're using is 43. So on the weapon, we're gonna say replace attack with skill number 43 and passive state 38. Now these numbers will be different in your game, just pay attention to what skill you're using and what state you're using and change them accordingly. And you can also put in cannot sell if you want the player not to be able to accidentally sell this weapon. Or you can leave its price zero. So now, this when you have the sword equipped, you get a state, and when you attack with it, it does this attack. It says Soul Slayer Slash instead of attack, and it's going to use this attack formula, which is referencing a variable. We don't know if this is the variable we want to use. We need to find a free one that's not being used by anything else. So I'm saying attack, by, uh, attack power times 4 plus a variable times 10. Let's figure out what variable we want to use. Let's go to common events. Inside our common event, we're going to click on new and we'll go to control variables and we're going to find one. So 86 I, ha I have is not used, so I'm going to call this one soul slayer slash. This is going to store the power. This is going to store how many souls the player has killed. We don't actually need to do anything. We just needed to find an empty one and put something there so we know we're using it for that. So I know I'm using it for 86, so I don't really need to do anything like I said, but I needed to know which number I'm using and, and name it. So I've named it, I can delete this, and it's still named that in the database. So that means whenever we reference 86, it's going to reference the Soul Slayer slash number. But now we have to figure out how do we make that number go up when we kill something? So we're going to use a state to do that using Yanfly's auto passive states. So we're going to make some code. We're going to put some code in the note tag here. I don't know exactly what it is, but I know what I'm doing. I just don't know the syntax. So let's find the help in the help file. Whenever the player performs a new action, or whenever the player finishes a new action, so we're going to reference action in, because when the player finishes an action, that will be when the enemy's HP would be zero. So we're gonna say custom action end effect. This is what we want. Okay, copy paste this. Custom action end effect. Paste it in here. Now all we really wanna do is check a condition saying if target.hp is less than equal to zero. If so, we do something. So what we're doing right here is when we finish our move while we have the sword on and we've done an action, if at the end of our turn the, our target, will, will it reference target? Maybe. What if we, what if we, uh, this might work. Target.
Ah, custom conclude effect. This is the final effect to be run after the batter, battler selects a target and will occur after the hit, miss, or evade confirmation and damage execution. So we're actually going to use this custom conclude effect because we want to check at the very end. Sorry about that. Custom conclude effect. So at the very end, after we've picked our target, so we do have a target, so it should be able to reference target at this point. At the very end, custom conclude effect. If the target's HP is less than equal to zero, which means if we've killed it, then all we have to do is add to that variable, right? So we're gonna say game dollar sign game variables dot value dot set value do we need to create a temporary we just can we can dot value plus plus will that actually work game dot uh, 86 X. So what we're going to do here is we're going to say var x equals dollar sign game variables dot value of 86 because that's the variable we we picked right whatever variable we pick we're going to reference right here plus one. So we're, we're creating a temporary variable and we're calling it x and then we're giving that variable the value of whatever is currently in variable number 86 and then we're adding one to it. If we kill the creature, we add one to this variable, but this will be removed after this frame. So we need to change the game variable to update. So we're saying this is that, that we're saying X is the, X is the value of 86 plus one. And then we're going to set the value of the game variable 86 to the value of X. It shouldn't be confusing. I may have said it in a confusing way though, but this is the code you do. Hopefully you see that. This should work. We need to test it. I don't have much time, I'm already over. But this should com should work completely. If we go to actors and we give Edmund Oh, one more thing we have to do. On the weapon, we need to specify the type of weapon. And we can give it an animation, right? This is all extra flash and stuff. So, and I don't have much time left. I have to end the stream pretty soon, but that should work. Give it whatever animation you want. I'm not gonna create a custom one, but you can create a custom one. So we'll just say this one. This will be easy, spends 15 minutes trying to make it. <laughs> yeah, because the method I had in mind wasn't built in. There's not a built in reference for that. Yeah, take a look at Yanfly's tips and tricks. I'm sure it's more straightforward than this, but this could work. This could work. Let me test it. Let's give my actor the Soul Slayer Blade. And we actually have to initialize. Oh, one more thing you'll have to do when you reference variables inside of a damage formula. Because in our skills, we're using a variable 86, right? So whenever you reference skills inside the damage formula, it'll do zero damage if you don't initialize it. So at some point in the game, at the very beginning, you need to auto run an event. And I have that over here where we set up all the variables and all of the stuff. So I'm going to 
create a new control variables and set soul slayer slash just set it to zero this is a safety so that the, the variable is initialized at the start and this is going to happen when the game starts and then it's the only time it's going to happen it's not going to happen any other time auto run and then it changes pages and never happens again so you set it to zero at the beginning of the game and that's it so let's set our starting position and run through a quick beta test we will need to give the player a weapon did i already do that soul slayer okay we have to pick ed Edmund, one W R R. Now we don't have our enchanting system because we have to talk to Doc Weez first. Let's test that because we changed that as well. I'm going to cheat and walk through the walls holding a button to save time. Okay. While attacking, blah, 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 you got this. I'm done equipped, whatever. You've activated the enchanting system. Yay. And now we can, I'm holding alt to jump, to go through walls. When you play test your game, you can hold alt and you can move through tiles that are normally not able to walk through. And if we go back to here, See, the enchanting system is there now. Sweet, so that works fine. Okay, now to test. Wait. You see how we have this little red thing right here? We have a, a passive state because we're equipping this soul slayer. If we take it off, we lose our passive state. And it's giving us 10 attack. And it gets a hidden bonus every time we kill something with it. But we need to test that. And you see how we're using a weapon or an attack replace? Instead of attack, it says Soul Slayer Slash because we're using that sword. It did zero. We initialized the value, but it's still doing zero. Okay, so that's, there's a bug there. In the skill, it's a normal attack, and it has whatever animation we say. Let's say this one. And we can give it a, a damage, uh, what do you call it? Not damage formula, a action sequence too. So I'm gonna take the basic attack, melee attack, action sequence, and put that on it as well. So we'll jump across the screen. And this is a battle screen skill, one enemy. Why is it dealing zero? This plus. Even 10 times zero is zero, so it would still be ATK times four plus zero. Why is the skill dealing zero? A variable in Jinx event you told that has zero. Right, that's the initialization event. That's supposed to be there so that dealing zero damage doesn't happen. <clears throat> it's supposed to go up. The formula itself should still deal this damage even if this part of it is zero. Let's put parentheses around this part. Plus this part. Let's have it not critical and no variance just to see. So it should still deal damage. Normal attack. Maybe we need to give it like an element, physical attack. Normal attack should still work. Either way, if we get this working or not, check out uh, Yanfly's T 
tips and trick video on NASA's Siphon Strike. NASA's Siphon Strike. Let me find it for you and I'll link it to you so that you can get a more cohesive tutorial besides this impromptu on the fly. Can fly NASA's siphon strike tips and tricks. Here we go. It's a six minute tutorial and it goes over how to do it. I should have watched this um, before I showed the tutorial. But that should fix it for you. That should work for you if it still works in 1.6. I know that's a, a kind of an old tips and tricks, but most of them <clears throat> age well. Let's try it this time. Let's see if we're still doing zero. If we're still doing zero. I don't know what I'm missing. Yeah, I'm missing something. I'm not sure. Because we're we're initializing the variable. Maybe we have to start it at one. Maybe we should initialize to one instead of to zero. I, I think it shouldn't matter in the formula, really. Because the formula should pick this. Let's start it with one inside of Jinx's event, and this will be the last test. If it doesn't work, then just use the Yanfly tips and tricks one. <clears throat> We're gonna initialize the variable 86 to one instead of zero. It shouldn't make a difference, honestly. I, I'm expecting it to still do zero damage for some reason, I'm not sure. Oh, that tutorial isn't what you want. You want the weapon to get stronger every time you kill an enemy with it. Isn't that what it does? Maybe I'll release a standalone tutorial. Let's edit it. No, there's something not quite right in the in the formula itself. There's a problem in the damage formula. Okay, what about if we don't use slash V and we just type in the, the actual code? I go dollar sign game variables dot value of 86 times 10. Let's try that. Instead of using slash V for variable like a text code, maybe there's you can't use a text code. I think that was the problem from the beginning. Maybe we have to do two slashes to to, to break out of the whatever let's try it like this a dot atk times 4 plus g 
game variables dot value 86 times 10 and keep in mind that it's capital sensitive so when you're doing camel case you're doing capital V on variable here it'll still do zero I think that's the problem honestly last time last time this what this should fix it Thanks for coming to the stream, Travis. How was your vacation? How was your weekend? Yeah, we're almost done here. Just doing a last minute special request tutorial. Special request. Blah -de blah let's walk on out. what it was okay that's exactly what it was you can't use the text code slash V in the damage formula you need to use dollar sign game variables dot value and then parentheses the number of the variable you're referencing <clears throat> So every time it kills a soul, it gets 10 more attack power, and you can change how much it gets by, by the formula, right? So that was 370, then 380. Then 390. And if you want to add variance, you can. I made it very static so that we can see that it actually gets stronger. But you see how when we killed that, when we attacked that time, it didn't go to 400, right? It did 390 twice. Why did it do 390 twice? Because it didn't kill it. It ran the state that checked to see if the thing was dead when we're done. And the, the last time, we, the second to last time we hit it, it didn't kill it. It brought its life almost down. So it did 390 again because it didn't get the power from the soul. Did you get it? Yay, we did it. We fixed it. Okay. Quick reference, what do we make? We made a weapon that does more damage as it kills creatures. What do we have to do? We have to use a few plugins. We have to use a core engine, battle engine core. We have to use weapon unleash and auto passive states. We go into the dat database, we create a weapon. We give it replace attack. We're gonna put the number of a skill because we're gonna need to make a skill. We're gonna make passive state. We're gonna have to create a state and this is arbitrary. So you need a weapon, a skill, and a state. That's the weapon, give it whatever you want. The skill is going to have an action sequence if you want it to have it, but it doesn't have to have an action sequence. You give it gain TP, because it's going to replace your basic attack, and you give it the damage formula, whatever you want, but you're going to use a variable. And how do you reference a variable in the damage formula? You do dollar sign game capital B on variables dot value. You put the number of the variable you're going to reference, and then you can multiply it. Say you wanted to get 100 damage every time it kills a creature, you just put 100 here. If you wanted to only get one damage, you just do that. All right, we make it a normal attack. You can give it variance, but I had it off so that we can show that it was gaining. We'll give it 20% variance. We'll let it critical hit as well. We don't want it to cost TP or MP because it's going to replace our attack. So that's another thing to remember. You can give it an, any animation you want. You can make a certain hit or physical attack, doesn't matter. That's our skill, we've done our weapon. Let's look at the state real quick. This is where we have our code. We're using a state. We don't want it to remove it at the end of battle because we're using this as a passive state on the weapon, remember, passive state. So we're looking for this number, 38. We're gonna use any number we want, but whatever number we use our state on, we have to put that number inside the weapon right there. In the state, you're gonna use a custom conclude effect, so you brackets, custom conclude effect, where here's our conditional statement. If target.hp is less than or equal to zero, then we're gonna create a temporary variable and assign the value of game variables 86 and add one to it, so x is that variable plus one. And then we're going to set the value of 86 to itself plus one. So game variables dot set value 86 comma x and our variable was called x. You can call this whatever you want. We can say y, 
and put Y right here. You can call this banana, but as long as you reference the same thing, variable banana, we'll call it variable soul right here. So you can see how it works. It's really arbitrary. And don't forget to do your end lines, which is semicolon. Uh, semicolon. You end the, the encapsulation, and then you do the slash custom conclude effect. So everything in here is the custom conclude effect. And that'll put everything together. So when the player kills a creature with the weapon, it will get stronger and it will store the value in 86. Remember not to use that variable for other things in the game because it'll change the value, right? But that's it, guys. That's going to do it for this extra long stream. We did a special request tutorial at the end and it kept going, kept going, kept going. We made some new sprites. We touched up some of the systems. We talked about some ideas conceptualize a few extra ideas. We beta tested our random encounter system and it works fine. It's better than the game's random encounter system. <clears throat> yeah. If you're gonna put variables in the damage formula, you have to put it out like this instead of using the text codes. But there may be a way to um, use text codes in there as well. I'm just not sure if you have to do those as regex or not. Anyway, thank you guys for coming to the stream. I really appreciate it. If you do like it, give this video a thumbs up. Uh, if you want to catch me live, I stream Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon, Eastern Standard Time. Sometimes we start a few minutes late. Sometimes we go over almost an hour. But yeah, you guys are awesome. Continue to stay awesome. If you want to hang out, uh, we have a Discord. The link is in the description below. If you want to support what I do, I have a Patreon. Patreon.com slash Driftwood Gaming. All support is appreciated. And if you like to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Driftwood Gaming. If you want to follow me on Twitch.tv slash Driftwood Gaming, that's cool. Subscribe to the channel if you're new here. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Oh, I saw that high blitz. It looked really good. Um, the game.
game is called Natural Explorers with an S at the end, so I didn't want to like, like, it seems like you worked hard on it and I appreciate that. I mean, I could rename the game, but. Doing good, Anfi. We just ended the stream. I'm gonna close it in a second. I've gotta to touch up this sprite. I think I just need to change my grid. Yeah, that's better. I don't want it to snap. How do I turn off that snap right now? Shift, control, and. There we go. Most of the time the script works beautifully, but every now and then it messes up. Like if there's certain generator parts that are very, very customized. But that's fine. Let's save this. There we go. And that'll work. Awesome, Travis. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do voiceovers in this project. It's going to have uh, voice acting. Many of them will be myself, but I would love to have some uh, outsourced VOs. So yeah, just uh, stay in touch on uh, Discord and tune into the live streams. It'll be a while because we have to do the storyline and then VO the storyline once it's been, once it goes through an editor. It'll be a little while. But thank you guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.